Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are joined by a longtime friend of the pod, a star from the podcast, and the one of the founding members of the Twitter Chess Punks community. Of course, he has helped out on the podcast many times before, including his Pawn Book Championship that you guys may have heard in episode 240. He is a software executive and a dad, but puts in tons of time working on his chess and has a unique approach to chess study and to sort of life management, which is why I call him the habit grandmaster. So for listeners who have not heard prior appearances by Neil Bruce, where we talked about uh, the woodpecker method and where he compared a bunch of pawn books, he is rejoining us right now to compare some more books, but we'll let him explain what is going on here for the uninitiated. First, let's welcome Neil back to Perpetual Chess. Hey, Neil, how are you? I'm great, Ben. I'm so excited. It's been several months since our last podcast together, and I've been working hard. So just to get everyone caught up, I'm six years into a 10-year plan to master the basics of chess tactics and strategy in games and openings. I'm just finishing my second year of a three-year plan specifically around chess strategy. And we've, we've past talked about general strategy books and pawn books. Now I'm ready to talk about these eight puzzle books, these strategy puzzle books. And I feel like tactical puzzle books gets a lot of, of attention, but I feel like uh, you know people should spend some time on some of these strategy puzzle books too. So we're going to be talking through them. I'll be ranking them along the way, my views on them. And I got some some great feedback from uh, some title players. Shout out to I am Kostya Kabutsky and uh, GM Peter Wells and some other uh, title players who helped me choose these books. And I'm just excited to... Uh, talk to you about them and our pro my process of reading them and playing through the games and chopping them up and making them flashcards. And it's just great to be here. Yeah. And we will be discussing eight books. Now, obviously there's more books that could have been chosen. And whenever we do one of these, we tend to get a couple of people asking, why didn't you talk about such and such book? Why didn't you talk about such and such book? But listen, what can I say? Neil's a working man. He's a dad. How many books can the guy do? It's been many months. I mean, not that many months since his last appearance. And he's doing eight books. I haven't read these all specifically for this podcast, I should say. I had previously read or worked with four of them. And the other four I was just aware of. Um, I, As I do, I did acquire them and review them in the past week. But I would just say I have some background information and some passing familiarity with them. So this is really Neil's show. Um, and Neil is the habit grandmaster. I'm just a protege. So um, it's as it should be. But without further ado, the books are called Practical Checks, Chess Exercises, Positional Chess Handbook, Jeremy Soman's Reassess Your Chess Workbook, his classic book, How to Reassess Your Chess, fourth edition, Techniques of Positional Play, um, Mastering Positional Sacrifices, Mastering Chess Strategy, and the Positional Chess Handbook. And we will be obviously saying who the authors are and discussing these books in great detail. But first, let's continue a little more big picture. So, Neil, I mean, it's a unique approach, this idea. I mean, the flashcards to begin with are somewhat unique, but flashcards, I think, are often associated with tactics, with wanting to remember certain things. I mean, even opening sequences, obviously, is a big part of uh, Chessable's um, offerings. But for why flashcards and why workbooks for positional puzzles? Yeah, as I read general strategy books, I realized these patterns kept coming up over and over again, much like you know, a fork is to a minority tack, is a skewer, is to like an octopus knight. And what I started realizing is that much like tactics, positional ideas can be learned. And I come from the, you know, Lee Hendricks school that you can only play what you see. And the difference between a tile player and an amateur like me is they've seen more. And so I really wanted to, one, get more positional patterns in my head. So I've made, uh, over 1,500 positional flashcards out of these books. But two, I think that 
it's not just like with tactics. You can't read a paragraph about minority attack and know from that one paragraph every time you should do that or know about about outposts in general and think that's going to know help you know always when to use an, an outpost for a night like on f5 i think that the repetition that people readily accept as necessary for tactics is equally as valid for positional concepts and it was really by seeing these same patterns over and over in the general strategy books and then even in the pawn books it made me realize I need to dig deep into this idea of positional puzzle books. And then uh, by studying a bunch of them, I've decided some are better than others. Yeah. And obviously, Neil will be revealing how he grades these um, and I'll be offering input where I can. But I did. I, I just find it. It's I found it almost revolutionary the more I thought about it, Neil, in terms of as I thought about how people improved at chess over time, um, you know, the the story is yet to be told. Obviously, you've had good success, and I know you feel like you're you're learning um, a lot from from all of the work that you're putting in, and you put in as you've mentioned to me before recording more work than usual for these books. But I just feel like historically, the way that positional chess has been learned has been primarily kind of the school of hard knocks, playing games, um, you know, reviewing your games, learning concepts. Obviously, stuff gets passed on in terms of uh, lessons, and of course, there's the, uh, the the various themes that will occur in different openings. Where you know you might know a common pawn sacrifice, you know, in a certain line or something like that. But in terms of just drilling them as patterns, um, it it's a unique approach. And it, in reviewing these books and looking through them, it, it really, I really started to find it interesting to try to think about how it would work for you. Because on the one hand, there are, there are novel concepts, you know, even for me, there were some that I hadn't seen before. Um, and obviously, even for the ones I have seen, to see them all assembled is quite interesting. But on the other, there's so many, and it's such a condensed period of time. So could you say, Neil, I know you feel like you've improved, but how has it impacted your general approach when you're playing, having done this sort of like binge into positional chess? Yeah, I am experimenting way more around things like uh, exchange sacks, pawn sacks, um, being willing to um, be patient and build up my uh, position before attacking. I mean, basically, the only time I used to sack was for a king uh, attack, period. And uh, this idea of uh, pawns are sometimes an enemy to get out of the way of your pieces is a very positional idea, but not was foreign to me, you know, and I think that you have to experiment and to experiment, you need confidence and to get confidence, you need practice and going through hundreds, almost thousands of positional puzzles has given me a lot more confidence to try new things and you know, one of the things that, that happened after I read uh, Mastering Positional Sacrifices is I played this game where I was able to, as, as the black uh, pieces, playing with the black pieces, I sacrificed a knight on F2 for a couple pawns, but it was not clear. I mean, the computer gives me a, like a plus one advantage after sacrificing the knight. It clearly was not a winning sacrifice, quote unquote, but it gave me some initiative. And I ended up uh, later in the game being able to do a really pretty queen sack to uh, mate him. But I would never have seen that knight uh, sacrifice on F2 if it wasn't for all these puzzle, puzzle books. Zero chance. So I'm a big believer that you need to see more opportunities. And to see more opportunities, you need to see many examples much like you can't see one fork and be comfortable with forks you can't see one uh pawn sack peace sack exchange sack uh, minority attack uh outposted knight on f5 octopus on d6 uh you need to see it over and i need to see it over and over again and i feel like uh people should be drilling on positional puzzles uh just like they do with tactical puzzles i think that i'm just starting to get the benefit of this but I would say you are going to be better than most players under 2200 if you're working these books. Okay. And just to play devil's advocate for a minute, I mean, you know, obviously 
everyone all the time is saying like it's tactics that primarily decide games. I don't know to what extent you've analyzed your results. Obviously, I know you've you've made continued improvements. But if someone were to say, well, like your games are still primarily decided by tactics, so why spend so many hours doing these positional puzzles? Uh, how what would your re- rebuttal be, Neil? Well, I spent four years on tactics and I spent nine months on positional puzzles. So uh, they're not the same value. Most of the strategy books will tell you that strategy is only possible when tactics don't get in the way. So you have to first look at everything from a tactical lens. And then if there's nothing tactical going on, then you say, well, how do I make my position better? Probably for a future tactic. So tactics, I think, are in many ways the heart of chess. Uh, But tactics don't just happen unless you're at the very lowest levels and people are constantly blundering. As you move up to 17, 18, 19, 2000 levels, you have to set yourself up to a good position. People are going to try to stop you from having an outpost on F5 or an octopus knight on D6. And so uh, what these books are trying to do is help you understand how to set yourself up to have better uh, positional understanding. The other thing I'll say, the huge thing I've noticed is for the average amateur player, if you can slightly improve your position when you're equal or slightly better, all kinds of bad things happen in your opponent's brain. They think, oh, why did he make that move? And what do I do now? And they they take a ton of time, uh, which is awesome for you. And two, they're much more likely to blunder out of like panic. And so just being able to slowly improve your position in a in a uh, you know logical way is going to help so many players under twenty two hundred beat their competitors simply because their their competitors aren't going to know what to do. They're going to kill a lot of time. They're more likely to blunder. There's tons of benefit from this. Okay, so you're not saying it's mutually exclusive from tactics. You've obviously put in your time doing tactics. And you mentioned under the rating of 2000, one thing we should probably say near the beginning is, I would say that's sort of the the primary audience. Some of these books are no joke. Um, Mastering Positional Sacrifices, as we'll talk about more. I mean, it's um, it's the the guy describes it as... um, he wants it to be almost like um, something that can be appreciated. So um, like a sort of historical canon of positional sacrifices. So obviously that's something that can be enjoyed by players of many levels. And it's often grandmasters and certainly masters playing the games. And Grandmaster Johan Helston's book is also, uh, you know, masters can can definitely learn a lot from it. So it goes up to that level. And in terms of like where it comes in on the lower end, and maybe Neil, as we go on, you can provide a little more color on which books are less challenging than others. But I mean, I would say as a baseline, maybe 15, 1600 USCF at the low end. Do you think that's right, Neil? Yeah, something like that. I mean, it's worth mentioning as far as prerequisites, what would, I'll tell you what I I did and I would recommend before picking up any of these positional puzzle books. One, I would say read one or more general strategy books, read Simple Chess, uh, maybe one or two more uh, general strategy books read uh, The Power of Pawns, uh, you know, or some kind of pawn book that you like. Understand uh, general strategic principles before diving into these, or you're just going to feel like you're you're missing all of them. Uh, read Pawn and, Power and Chess. <laughs> my system. All the best <laughs> ones. Uh, and then, then get yourself into these. And I would say that, um, you know, the way you can you can study them varies based on your level. I mean, I I can tell you when I started doing tactics, I couldn't for the life of me, I don't care how much time you gave me, I couldn't solve a three move tactic or a four move tactic. So when I started reading books that were around three and four move tactics, I focused more on the answers and writing down why they made sense than I did on the questions. And doing that hundreds and thousands of times got me to the point where I had the confidence and ability and the skill to do four, five, six move tactics. I think the same thing applies here. If you pick up uh, Mastering Chess Strategy and um, and you're under 2,000, you might do better doing what I did, which is like literally writing down in your own words why these answers make sense. I did that for 600 flashcards that I made out of that book. And I did that for, you know, hundreds of other uh, examples of these different books. 
And that's when you start to notice that you're getting stronger and your confidence will grow. So I think if you're if you're under 2,000, put more energy into trying to understand the answers. If you're over 2,000, look at this as a test that you can see, you know, how good am I? And if I'm not good enough, then maybe revisit some areas where you've got gaps. I love this idea of writing down the answers. It's like, you know, Ernest Hemingway famously like wanted to become a great writer. So he took his favorite writer's books and just wrote them out by hand mm -hmm. because he wanted to feel it, you know? <laughs> um, so that that's the approach you're taking to uh, to chess puzzles. It's, it's cool to see. Um, so Neil, anything in, are we ready to dive into the books? I mean, we do need to take a break, but is there anything we should say uh, before the break in terms of uh, just sort of uh, overview of what we're going to discuss, or is it book time? Well, I will mention a couple honorary mentions. Of two. I actually have read 10 books, and I know you're right. I'm, I'm the only one guy, and I have a busy life. And I, I've only <laughs> <It's> crazy. <but laughs> I want to mention two other books that aren't in the list very quickly because they get mentioned uh, they get re uh, recommended, and I just wanted to make a comment about it. one is Winning Chess Strategy for Kids. Uh, it's by a Jeff great, Coakley. By yeah. Coakley. It's a very good book. Here's the thing. the pro It's got pros and it's got puzzles. And the, cartoons. And cartoons. The pros, there are frankly better books on strategy than that book on the pros side. Winning Chess, uh, uh, you know, Simple Chess, Winning, uh, you know, Winning Chess Strategies. There are a lot of other books that are better than uh, than Coakley's strategy book. The other problem with that book is I did the I counted it out. Something like 75, 80% of the quote unquote puzzles, positional puzzles are really tactics. And so it's it's a misnomer, I think, on that level. So while lots of people recommend it, I frankly think his tactics books are some of the best there are, but I would skip the uh, winning chess strategy for kids uh, because I think there are better books. It's not really a strategy puzzle book, uh, but you're going to hear that book from time to time. The other one was a recommendation by Peter Wells. GM Peter Wells recommended this book, Beyond Material, which I don't know. Have you ever looked at that one? Yeah, Davrin Koyasevich, who was on the podcast, uh, friend of the show, um, and wrote the the incredible book, um, How to Choose a Chess Study Plan. Uh, this was a, a, I believe this book also won awards um, and preceded it. So, yeah, I'm familiar with that book. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting book. I read it as well. The thing is, is it, it recommends things. It's kind of like his, his uh, study guy where he's like, you know, put in four or five hours a day. He's got a right. thing here where he says, spend three to four hours building a psychological profile in Beyond Material. He's like, spend three or four hours building a psychological profile of your opponent. And then even if you know the best move, one of the psychological strategies could be play a slightly worse move if you think it's not in their style. Okay, so none of that's going to happen for an amateur. If right. you find the best move, you're just playing it. You're not going to be like trying to double, uh, you know, swerve on your opponents. So I, I think Beyond Material is at the other end, where I would say Winning Chess Strategy for Kids is probably a weaker book. I would say Beyond Material is like beyond the, this category. It's more of a title player book. I so agree. if you're your title player... I really do think Beyond Material is probably an awesome book. Um, so those two books, I felt like were either too weak or too strong for the rest of these. But ready for your break, and then let's uh, let's dive into the uh, the eight books. You're such a pro. I should just let you take it away. But I do want to add one thing because just because winning chess strategies that hasn't come up that often on the podcast. But just for any listeners who aren't familiar with it, um, it's just it's a legendary book, especially if you're a chess teacher. Um, it it explains sort of positional concepts like rooks on the seventh rank and stuff like that in a way that kids can understand. So it's quite rare. And as Neil has alluded to, I love that. And Neil's been saying this for years. He has no compunction about like studying books made for kids. Um, so you do, you do kind of have to check your ego if you're going to pick it up and read it because there's, as I said, it's filled with cartoons. You know, the language is obviously um, written at an accessible level. But I, I am a big fan of the material, and I know that, uh, you know, um, world-class trainers like Elizabeth Spiegel, she's the one who first turned me on to it. I mean, she's been drawing on Jeff Coakley's material for more than a decade. And um, and as Neil said, his puzzle books are really good, too. And uh, then 
since there's not as much pros, there's not as much kids stuff in them either. Um, so I did just want to add that because uh, listeners, especially if you're like aspiring to sort of the 1600 level, like Neil said, or again, if you're doing scholastic programs, those are definitely books uh, you want to be aware of. Um, but on that note, as Neil said, uh, Neil, you want to take us to break? Yeah. Why don't we hear from some of our sponsors and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Excellent as always. Our friends at Chessable keep dropping new courses. Some of their latest include Play the Open Sicilian One by Grandmaster Miguel Santos. That's got 15 trainable lines that you can use to play against the Open Sicilian kind of one-stop shopping for an opening that can be overwhelming to learn. And friend of the pod, Simon Williams, is out with The Harry Attack, fighting kingside Fianchettos after 1D4, along with I am Richard Palliser. And they've got tons of new stuff coming from Grandmaster Hans Neiman, Linear Dominguez, and the list goes on. And all of their courses, of course, utilize space repetition to help you remember the opening or tactical sequence or end game that you learn. So be sure to go to chessable.com and take a look at what is new. And we are back and we are ready for the main event. So we've got eight Positional puzzle books. Again, amazing that Neil has done these all since I last spoke with him. I, you know, my eyes were glazing over just skimming them this week. Um, and Neil is going to count them down. So I actually didn't know the format until we were uh, working on an outline together. I thought it was going to be March Madness slash like elimination style because he's been posting a bracket on Twitter. But I think this is actually more user friendly to count down from what he found to be the least uh, helpful book, you know. Apologies to the authors, um, to the most helpful. So, Neil, are we ready to reveal number eight in this competition of eight? We are. So coming in at number eight in the Chess Strategy Puzzle Book Championship is Silman's relatively old Reassess Your Chess Workbook. So back in uh, 2001, uh, this book got published. Do you want to give a little backstory before I, I give my critique? Yeah, I mean, it's... Meant to be a supplement, I guess, to reassess your chess, but it's also kind of a standalone book. I mean, he's got puzzles in it, but don't let the title fool you. There's lots of explanations. Um, and and yeah, I don't have as much familiarity with this one as with reassess your chess, which, of course, we'll be talking about and which I've uh, I've done a podcast about. Um, but, you know, it's classic. Jeremy Silman, lots of prose. He's got a very readable style. I think that's part of the reason he's found such an audience is um, he he writes in a very relatable style, and he's really got his finger on the pulse of uh, of uh, the adult learner and was ahead of his time in that regard. I mean, as Neil said, we're talking about a book that's a a, a couple decades old, but there are some some flaws with this book as well. Neil, uh, do you want to? Um, you know, reveal why it's number eight? Yeah, so I should say, and this is this book is an example of this, I checked every single one of the puzzles, all, you know, 1,700 of the positional um, puzzles that I'm creating. I checked them with Stockfish 14. And I can tell you, this book did not do well. It <laughs> was clearly not computer checked. And people have called out Selman on this book and his third edition is having examples that just don't hold up. And my view is if you're trying to learn uh, a, a from positional puzzle books and the, the answer, quote unquote, given answer is, you know, two or more pawns worse than another move, then that's a fail. And so you can't have that big of a discrepancy in too many of the puzzles in this book. I just couldn't make a flashcard out of it because they were just broken puzzles. And so I think that I will talk more about uh, with Reassess Your Chess 4th Edition. He basically redid this book, uh, but he used a computer. It's obvious he did. He talks about using Ripka when he when he did the 4th Edition. And so what I'm telling you is don't bother with, with Reassess Your Chess Workbook. If you own it, use it to hold a door open. That's its best purpose. <laughs> and use the 4th Edition, which has... More puzzles, actually. I think the workbook only has 100, and I think the, the fourth edition has 117. It has more puzzles, as much better puzzles. It's just a better book. So don't bother with the workbook. Is That's why that's number eight. Okay, yeah. And in addition to checking out these books, this is one that's been on my shelf for 20 years, but I've never... 
uh, I've never read it properly and I did skim it, but I also read online and uh, Dr. Potzer, Jostein Langstrom, a uh, friend of the pod had written a review about it and he was kind of tepid about it as well. He basically said that, that the puzzles jump around a lot in terms of uh, degree of difficulty and that some of the explanations are lacking. Um, as for the computer thing, Neil, I know you, the engine of analysis, I know you've had some back and forths with people like Kostya Kovutsky online where, you know, he pushes back a, against this idea that like you can just put it into the computer and the computer can reject it as a learning exercise. So I did want to add that because, you know, some might argue that, look, these puzzles are trying to teach you how to think. So even if the analysis turns out not to be great, if it exposes you to an idea that you weren't exposed to, um, then that's still a win. But on the other hand, you know, we, we have to judge the books by their current contemporaries. And obviously there are modern books that might have some of the same benefits of Selman's book, but are updated. So um, I see both sides of the argument, but I did just want to call attention to it since I'd, I've seen you uh, yeah. talk to people about that online. Yeah, let me spend a minute talking about my friend Kostya. So my rule is the the answer has to be within a pawn of another kind of answer. It, 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 if it's like three or four pawns off, then it's a broken puzzle. And I'm telling you, like lots of these uh, older books are just, they have broken puzzles in them because they were never computer checked. And so I I will pick, and I've made lots of flashcards where the computer answer is slightly better than the puzzle answer, but the puzzle answer is so clearly valuable and it's teaching a valuable lesson that I still count it as a quality puzzle. So does that make sense? I'm looking for a one, yeah. one, one pawn variant. If you're more than a pawn off, then I've got questions. I, I hear you. Yeah. And, you know, we have limited time. So yeah. even this book being eighth, you know, out of these eight, it's not a terrible book. You know, there, there are many worse books. Um, but it's just you already started from a pile of books that were recommended to you. So there's a there's an inherent quality to the books you're you're debating. And, yeah, this one is not as quality as some of the others. So let's let's move on to number seven, Neil. Yeah. So this is going to be somewhat controversial because a couple different uh, title players had very fond memories of it. And so coming in at number seven in my chess strategy puzzle book championship is the positional chess handbook by uh, Gelfer. So I'll let you talk a little bit about the backstory on it. Sure. Yeah. So that's FM Israeli Gelfer, not to be confused with Grandmaster Yefem Gelfer. Um, it was, let's see. So he's an Israeli-based trainer and international organizer. The book was originally published in 1991, um, and it's inexpensive, uh, 10 bucks on, Kim, on Kindle, 12 for the paperback. Um, it's got topics such as a good bishop versus a bad knight, uh, bishops of the same color, bishops of opposite colors, knight, uh, two pieces against a rook in various permutations. Um, so... You know, I think I published in 1991, I think this book was probably quite original at the time it came out, but it's another one where um, it's probably being dinged a little bit because there have been better versions that have come out. What else would you say about it, Neil? Well, the the um, the quality of the, um, you know, pieces and in, in the positions is terrible. Like, I, I don't know if you noticed that. In, yeah, in yeah. New York. I, it was on Kindle, so I wasn't sure to what extent Kindle was at fault, but go ahead. Yeah, the book is it's it's possible to understand the positions, but it takes effort uh, because the quality of the of the positions, the, the diagrams, the, the diagrams. Yeah. yeah, the diagrams are just is it a pawn? Is it a bishop? It, it's like you don't want to be playing that game when you're looking at 495 positions. So I think that I mean, the short version of this is much like Silman made a better version of the workbook with the fourth edition. I would say that Helston's book is basically the modern version of positional chess handbook. If I had no access to these modern books, I'm sure I would, by comparison, really like. And I can see why 20 years ago, people liked positional chess handbook. But today there are better versions of the, basically the same book. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and and again, this is not one that I read. This is one that I picked up and skimmed. So I, I won't uh, 
I won't pretend to have more to add. So let's get to number six, Neil. What's uh, what's number six? So six is com- coming in. Number six is how to re- how to reassess your chest. Fourth edition. That's a mammoth book that I know Ben has pros and cons on. Do you want to give a little backstory? Because I know you guys have done some work on this book. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we did a whole podcast about this book, book recap number two. So anyone who, and obviously, uh, listeners, I mean, it's a classic book, super well-known, huge seller. So I think a lot of you will already be familiar with it. I think it's one of those books where like, um, even if you haven't read it, there's a good chance you own it because it gets recommended so often. Um, and it's been around for a while. Um, tons of material in it. Like, I mean, it's, it's not, it's more expensive than some of these other books, 23 on Kindle, 26 on paperback, but just reams and reams of material, um, both in terms of like when he's addressing a specific theme and the number of themes. Of course, it's famous for its list of imbalances. Some of the imbalances are superior minor piece, pawn structure, space, material, control of a key file, control of a weak square, lead and development, initiative, king safety, statics versus dynamics. And um, I've mentioned before on the pod, uh, you know, my um, my review of it was pretty positive with uh, Todd Kennedy when we did the podcast. And I still like the book, but it's just as I've like worked with Neil and read books like Simple Chess um, and Winning Chess Strategy over the time, over time, there are other books that I like better. Um, Neil, what, what's your perspective? So this is switching. So the first two books, like I mentioned, I, I put in the don't bother category. I would put this in the next book in what I'll call the extra credit category. It has more puzzles than a lot of these other books. It's got 117, I think. It's got over 100 annotated games. It's a great, uh, I shouldn't say great. It's a good general strategy prose book. But I look at this book as a Swiss Army knife. Swiss Army knives in, by concept. Are, are wonderful. And if, if, if you're going to read only one strategy book in your whole life, I probably would recommend this one. But the problem with Swiss Army Knives is they're terrible when you're trying to cut a steak. They're terrible when you're trying to cut down a tree. You can do it, but it will take you a long time. And so I think there are better books. There are better, uh, you know, annotated game books. There are better positional general prose books. There are better positional puzzle books. But it has it all. So like, you know, it's hard. This is a hard book to rank because if I was going to recommend only one of of all these things, I'd probably recommend this one. But I would tell you, if you're going to buy more than one, you don't need to buy this one. Yeah, it's the the all you can eat buffet of uh, decent food across the board. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like you're in Vegas and you're just (laughs) going for that buffet and you don't really notice it doesn't taste as good as some other things. Yeah. Uh, but again, he, he is a good writer. And the other sort of critique I've landed on as I've read more and more books is it it may just try to do a bit too much. Um, mm-hmm. It's just there's so much stuff in there that and the explanations are good. But still, I mean, it's it, it's kind of information overload, or at least I think it runs that risk. Um so moving on to number, oh, and by the way, I haven't been able to interview Jeremy Silman. People are asking me about him all the time. Um, you know, hope springs eternal. I don't know if these reviews will help, but we've tried the positive, the glowing review approach. Now, <laughs> now, now we'll throw some shade, but someday I would love to interview you, Jeremy, if you uh, catch wind of this. Well, um, I, I will say like a quick Jeremy story. Years and years ago, when I first got into chess, I actually emailed him and he replied. Uh, which I was shocked about uh, because he's such a uh, you know legendary figure in chess uh, training, and I I think he has contributed a tremendous amount. Uh, I love his his end game book. I think that's uh, when I eventually do those end game reviews, I'm going to I'm sure rank that pretty highly. But he was incredibly kind to a guy who was just trying to get his arms around chess, and so. I, I, that's my one personal experience with him was that email exchange. And so, you know, I, I'm not going to love every book the same, but I think the guy seems like a really good guy. Yeah. And, and legendary author, of course. Um, all right. On to number five, Neil. Yeah. So number five is, is my last book in the kind of what I call extra credit category. Uh, it's not a required book, but it's, it's a good book. Just like Sil- Silman's book is good. So coming in number five is, improve your chess pattern recognition. So you want to give a little ba- background on that? Uh, yes, it's by Arthur van der Uto Wittering. I'm sure I pronounced that perfectly. He is a uh, Dutch IM. Um, 
it's from a series. He's also uh, done train your chest pattern recognition and one that is ostensibly more for beginners. Although I, again, found a review from Chris Wainscott online where he said even that is not really um, not really for beginners. So uh, and shout out to Chris, whose blog you should read as well when he is able to review books. Um, so it's available in many formats on Kindle, on the new in chess reader, which is nice um, because then you can actually scroll through the games. Um, 300 plus pages. He's got some nice use of terms like a killer knight, octopus, beastly bishop. He was good at like naming things, which always adds nice summaries at the end of chapters. Um, what else might you add, Neil? I liked it. I think of it as a book that's uh, where should my pieces go? So he puts a lot of energy, like you said, on like getting a knight, for example, to e6 or getting a knight to f5 or getting a bishop to, to d6, or, you know, things like this. And and you're going to, if you if you do what, what we advise, which is you read some general strategy books first, you're going to know these are where your pieces should go. And so I would say I didn't get anything new out of this book, so I can't put it in my highly recommended category. But if your goal is just to drill on stuff and make sure that you're taking conscious competence and turning it into unconscious competence, then, you know, by all means, if you're going to do several books, then I would do this one too. But if you if you have limited time, I think you could skip this and still get a lot of value out of the rest of the books I'm going to cover. Okay, yeah. And again, I... Uh... I didn't have prior familiarity with it, but but from from what I saw, it looked pretty good. But that's also going to be true of the subsequent books we're talking about. Um, so we're going to take another break to hear from our sponsors, and then we've got the final four coming up. Listeners, I just got an update from aimchess.com, and unfortunately, I'm still behind on the clock 72% of the time. Working to get better. Progress is not just a straight line upward, but I am getting better in the other aspects of your game, which Aim Chess can measure, which are openings, tactics, endings, advantage, capitalization, and resourcefulness. And of course, Aim Chess automatically gathers your games from the major chess playing sites to give you actionable insights and even quiz you on tactics that you may have missed during your game. So please go to aimchess.com and check out the product. And if you do decide to subscribe, use the promo code perpetual30 to get a discount on aimchess.com. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by betterhelp.com. If you're struggling with depression, anxiety, or another mental health issue, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist in under 48 hours. It's professional therapy done securely online. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions or send a message to your therapist as needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy and financial aid is available. If you go to their website, you'll see lots of testimonials such as this one. Working with Kendall Bradford on transforming my thought patterns has been very helpful on my journey to improve my mental health. You'll read lots of others like that as well. If you go to the website, betterhelp.com slash chess, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash chess. And, and if you use that URL, you get 10% off for your first month of use. More details are in the show description. And we are back and we are at the final four. So uh, what came in fourth place, Neil? Yeah, so coming in at fourth place is Techniques of Positional Play. It was the last book I read. It was the last entry, a, a, a late entry into this grouping. But I had so many people on Twitter say, you need to include this book. I am so grateful that I did. What's different about this book from the previous book is this is not a what book. This is a how book. It gives you little techniques, just like the title says, of how to get yourself into a better position. And, and I can give lots of examples, but do you want to give a little backstory first? Sure, yeah. So the authors are Valerie Bronznik, who is a Ukrainian IM. Shout out to Ukraine. We're all rooting for you. He's based in Germany. And Anatoly Terekin, who is a well-known Russian trainer who leads a chess academy in Perm. Um, they have cool. They have 45 positional ideas presented with puzzles. Uh, they they also coined some terms. They have some cool ones. I mean, obviously, octopus is tried and true, as we referred to in the previous review. But they've got ones like wave breaker that I'd never heard before, like where you put your pawns in a certain configuration. Um, 
I found a friend of the pod, Sam Copeland of chess.com, wrote a review for his chess.com blog where he just raved about it. And Sam's YouTube channel is amazing. His knowledge of chess history is uh, quite impressive. So that that's high praise of that book coming from Sam. And now we've got the Neil Bruce stamp of approval as well, right, Neil? Yeah, there are very small but important, and that's what positional ideas often are, small but important ways to improve your position, like things like how to create an impregnable outpost, how to destroy an outpost, how to deal with a pawn triangle, which I've never seen in any of the other books, how to remove the right pieces that are blocking you from getting to the seventh rank, which is another idea that I think I kind of intuitively understood, but this book helps you understand. Why are rook pawns always being thrown forward on alpha zero games? Well, this has a whole chapter on that. For lots of different reasons, rook pawns can become really powerful weapons. And so if you're looking like I was for practical examples this one is going to give you advice that you're not going to get another book. So I, I put this in my first of my four of high recommend. Yeah. And then just one other thing to add about this. I picked this up on Kindle. It is available as well on New In Chess Reader and, uh, of course, in book format as well. Um, it didn't have as many diagrams as some other books, which if you're using a reader like New In Chess or if you're actually doing the work like Neil with a chess set, it's not an issue. But if you're just kind of, uh, you know, paging through a book in Kindle format, I wouldn't really recommend it for this book. Uh, some of the others are better. You know, it does have a diagram for every puzzle, obviously, but then they're often playing through like 20 moves subsequently in a game. And there's no subsequent diagrams on those 20 moves. So again, depending on how you're consuming the book, that may or may not be an issue. But if you are thinking about getting it, um, just something to keep in mind. And again, something like the new in chess app is, uh, is always a good choice, um, as well as using an actual chess set w- w- with an actual book. Um, so we got the, the top three, Neil. Yeah. So coming in at number three is one of the ones that I had the most fun with, which is mastering positional sacrifices. So why don't you give us a little backstory on that one, Ben? Yeah, this is a book I've been hearing about for a couple years now, I hadn't had the chance to check it out. It's by Merlin van Delft, who is a well-known trainer from the Netherlands. Um, really impressive knowledge of sort of uh, chess history and uh, um, chess culture just in in reading the first, you know, 20 percent of this book or something. He says he's always been a fan of positional chess sacrifices. It's his favorite theme in chess. So it seemed almost like, yes, he wants to help you get better at chess, but he also kind of wanted to write like the the comprehensive history of positional sacrifices. So he tries to walk you through things chronologically. So it's, it's that rare book that I feel like it might be equal parts sort of, um, you know, for the, the chess appreciator and the chess improver both might enjoy this book. It's got a nice layout. It's well well arranged. It's got the classic games. Like there's obviously a lot of classic positional sacrifices, but it's also got some lesser known ones, um, including kind of like his Dutch, you know, titled player, but not famous compatriots. So lots of original examples as well. Um, I didn't really, as I was reading it, Neil, I didn't really feel like it was a puzzle book per se. Do you think mm. that's that's a fair assessment? Well, it has about 48 puzzles at the end of the book. I will end up uh, making more like 100 flashcards out of it because I'm chopping up all the exclam uh, positions in the in the examples along the way too. And so if you do all that, it's it's not un- unlike a lot of the other books as far as the, the number of actual quote-unquote puzzles. I, I will, I'll just read a quote. Now, this is actually from the book beyond material, but it, it, it speaks to master, mastering positional sacrifices. The first sentence of beyond material, uh, the, the author is quoting his coach. He says, you will become a strong player once you learn how to properly sacrifice a pawn. And I think that is really the heart of this book of mastering positional sacrifices is if you're under 2200, and I know that was a long time for you, Ben, so probably harder for you if we go back to the whole... Oh, no. I'm you, back under 2200. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, you still have that confidence. So I'm just right. going to go with someone who's got less confidence. So okay. sacrificing pawns, sacrificing exchanges, uh, you, you know, these are things that the average player under 2200 isn't even considering. And 
going through game after game after game and examples and examples. I mean, one of the great points that uh, the, the author makes about sacrifices is there's really a continuum between a tactical sacrifice and a positional sacrifice. And frankly, even some of his examples that he calls positional, I would call more tactical, but it's irrelevant. What's relevant is you have to be willing to see more options on the board. I think that's one of the hardest things for amateur players to do is to is to come up with quality candidate moves that can't be every possible move, but they also can't be narrowed down to, am I going to lose material? Or you've got to look at these moves that are going to be forcing and maybe not immediately give you value. So again, I'll, I will say that, uh, you know, full disclosure that I'm very biased uh, with this book because right after studying it, I played this game where I sacrificed a, a knight on F2 uh, in that game I was talking about earlier where um, I I would never have considered that move if I hadn't been exposed to all these positional sacrifices. And so I think that if you want to get to 1900, 2000, 2100, maybe 2200, you've got to learn how to uh, be more flexible in your thinking. You've got to be willing to sack pawns and pieces in order to open up lanes for your for your bishops and your rooks, et cetera. And so I think that it's probably the most uh, valuable thing that will separate you from lower level players is the ability to be more creative and willing to sacrifice material for positional advantages. So for those reasons, I put it in my high recommend category. Yeah. And I just have a couple of things to add. Number one, Neil's game is off the hook. You guys got to check it out. It's, um, uh, I am Andres Toth did a, a recap of it. It's an 11 minute YouTube video in and out quickly. Just appreciate Neil's Mona Lisa. It's a, it's a beautiful game. Um, so I I'll link to that in the show notes, but you guys, I mean, it, it really is an impressive game. And then the other thing I just want to add hearing Neil discuss this is, you know, uh, when Sam Copeland, the aforementioned Sam Copeland and I reviewed The Life and Games of Mikhail Tal, a fantastic book, of course, le- uh, by Legend of the Game, we were, you know, Sam's like a 2300 USCF, I'm like 2150, and we were both talking about sort of our um, hesitance to sacrifice for sort of nebulous compensation. Like, if it's a raging attack and it's called for, that's one thing, but uh, you know, even up towards Sam's level at 2300, it can still be hard to um, to pull the trigger if it's for something uh, less concrete. So I get that. You know, I feel that too. Um, but I did just want to kind of throw in that what Neil's saying about learning to appreciate that at the club level, like in a sense, um, the lower rated you are, the the more willing to sacrifice you can be because your opponents are still going to make plenty of mistakes. So even if you're like, first of all, you got to trust your instincts. Hopefully, if you're considering a sacrifice, it will turn out to have had some merit at the least. But if it hasn't, like the base case is not that your opponent just takes the material and just like effortlessly grounds you down from there. Like, you know, there will be another mistake in the course of the game, whether it's by you or by your opponent. So that's just an, a little pep talk as, as well to sort of, um, because again, it's something I, I myself struggle with in my games where like, if you're not sure it can be easy just not to play the sacrifice. But, um, but I do think it, like pulling the trigger is, is a crucial part of uh, chess growth. Great points. All right. So number two, so we're down to our final two and you probably can figure out who they are, which ones they are, if you've been following along. But number two was actually the first of my 36 strategy books that I read when I switched from tactics to strategy. It is Practical Chess Exercises by Ray Cheng. Do you want to give a little backstory on that one? Yeah, this is another one I've been a fan of for a long time. Very unique book. I, Ray Cheng is a club level player. The intro is, or sorry, the foreword is by John Watson. Uh, I am John Watson, of course, legendary author and trainer who was actually working with with Ray Cheng. Cheng. Um, and he, in it, they talk about sort of, he had this sort of unique vision of some things that we've talked about on the podcast over the years where like, it's nice if you have a puzzle and you don't know if it's a tactical or a positional puzzle. Maybe if you don't know the exact degree of difficulty, although I'll say that 
the degree of difficulty isn't like widely varying the right. way it might be in some other books, but um, at least it's it's not strictly sequential. Um, it's thoughtfully presented. You know, it's one puzzle per page with an answer with an explanation on the back. Um, it's inexpensive, both in paper and uh, Kindle format. Um, so, and it's another book along with the other one that we haven't discussed yet, that's a great resource for trainers because it just kind of touches on a wide variety of themes. Um, so that's part of the reason that I've had it on my radar for a long time is I've used a lot of the positions and, and enjoyed uh, a lot of the positions. So yeah, I've been a fan of this book for a long time and uh, in, in reviewing it continue to be. Yeah, if you're looking for quality and quantity of puzzles, it's hard to beat this book. There are 600 Prob uh, definitely there are more tactical, so it might be like 350, 250, or 400, 200, leading towards the tactic side. But there are more strategy puzzles in this one book than almost all the other books. Uh, plus, you get all the tactical ones for free. So I, I also think there's something, like you were saying, been very valuable about when you're going through a stack of puzzles, not knowing whether it's in a book or you've made flashcards or however you do it, not knowing whether it's a positional puzzle or a tactical puzzle is really useful because in a book, in a game, no one's going to whisper in your ear what kind it is. And it's easy if you're doing all of one type to be looking only for that type. And so I think it was a creative use and, and, you know, pound for pound, the volume and quality of the puzzles, you know, it's hard to beat. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I, and the only thing missing is unlike the woodpecker method, it doesn't have any red herring puzzles, right? Neil right. puzzles no. where there's no real answer. Correct. I actually that... think I hate those. So I'm glad it doesn't, but go on. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, that's uh that can be a bit cruel, but, but yeah, definitely agree with, with what Neil was saying about it. It's nice when you're not sort of prompted to, for exactly what to look for. And yeah, I mean, this book having come out in 2008, I definitely feel like it was both ahead of its time and holds up well. But I also would echo what Neil said is I was even a little surprised to see it included here because I thought of it as more tactical than positional, which Neil's Neil's estimates of the the number of puzzles confirm. But that is just something for listeners to keep in mind. But but I mean, it's a fantastic book. Yeah, I mean, let's say it has 200. Let's be really conservative and say only 200. I think it's more like 250, but it's hard to find a puzzle book that has 200 quality positional puzzles in it, period. Uh, you know, the exception is the last book, but yeah. like, uh, you know, like pound for pound, you know, like the mastering positional sacrifices has 48. I think the, uh, you know, the improve your um, chest pattern recognition has in, like around 50 T techniques of positional play has around 50. So like this is giving you more puzzles than most of these other books combined. And so I think to some extent you need volume if you're going to really um, work on mastering a lot of different ideas and it has both the quality and the quantity, highly recommend the book. Yeah. And it's got King and Pawn end games. And again, because of the format, you don't even have to make the Neil Bruce fl flashcards if you don't want to. You could just look at one page and then flip it over and look at the answer. So yeah, thumbs up, but on to number one, which the discerning listener may have figured out. But Neil, what's number one? Yeah, so number one, I would say by a country mile is Helston's Mastering Chess Strategy. I I don't think any other book even comes close. Uh, as I said, I think Positional Chess Handbook uh, was probably its best in its time, but it's truly the modern version of that book. And it's got way more examples there's virtually no pros. It's example, example, example. It's kind of the agard method. Example, 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 and then tons, excuse me, tons of puzzles that are um, at the end of the book. And so, if you want to dive deep into positional puzzles, this is by far the best book to do it. Yeah, uh, and another book that's revered by chess students and chess trainers alike. Uh, Johan Helston is 2006 Swedish champion. Uh, these days he lives in Ecuador. He's a top chess trainer and author. He's actually written three books and well, he's also written an opening book. But aside from the opening book, there's mastering endgame strategy, mastering opening strategy, and this which was this which came out first, mastering chess strategy. And I actually I've long been a fan of this book. It's another one that uh, Elizabeth Spiegel turned me on to a long time ago, and Greg Shahadi also recommended it to me, like right when it came out. Um, 
So I've long been a fan of this book, but I actually just interviewed him for Perpetual Chess last week, something I've been wanting to do forever. It's one of those uh, subjects that I just hadn't gotten, gotten around to interviewing. Um, so, and actually, like I knew that Neil was reviewing this book and I knew it was a fantastic book from my own experiences, but I didn't know it was going to win the contest. And like, we don't, I didn't talk much about the contest with him. It was more sort of um, uh, chess improvement Q&A. Um, I got a lot of questions from people like Neil, uh, very much like Neil, on from Chess Twitter. And it's a great interview. And actually, I'm going to release this first. And then next week, hopefully, you guys can can listen in to hear all of Johan's chess improvement tips. Uh, he also has a um, treasure trove of videos on YouTube because he does a lot of lectures for the U.S. Chess School. But anyway, let's get let's get back to the book. Could could we say a bit more about what differentiates it, Neil? Yeah. So I, as I mentioned before, I double checked every puzzle and and all the the you know exclam positions within the examples beforehand, and none of the other books had uh, the quality from a Stockfish uh, fourteen perspective of, of this one. So I don't think you have to choose. I think you can have quality and quantity and uh, computer verification, I think helps improve that. It's going to give you hundreds and hundreds. I ended up making, I think, 600 flashcards out of just this one book. It's a big book. It's going to take you a while. Some of these books I did in under a month. This one was more like two and a half. So that's for non Neil speak. That's like a year. Like, don't be right. surprised if you spend a year on this book. But it, every day you put into it, it's going to be well worth it. Yeah, and it's available in tons of formats. It's on Kindle. Um, it's on Chessable, and it's it's pretty good for the Chessable format. And one thing he did talk about in our interview is he's very still engaged with these courses. I mean, this and his other books are you know more than ten years old, but because they've been re-released on Chessable and because you can uh, give feedback on specific puzzles. Um, he's updating them, at least on Chessable. The other thing is I, I've bought this book in paper form, but then because it's an everyman chess book, uh, they often w will, if you buy their ebook through their website, they'll send you the PGNs, um, which if you're a chess based user is huge because then you just have the 600 puzzles. So especially for chess trainers who are doing lessons online. Um, to spend like 20 bucks and be able to just call up these PGNs, which obviously you can also load into a Lee Chess study. Um, so, you know, very user friendly across the board in terms of like the ways that you can use this course and just fantastic material. Um, you know, not not the most not the least expensive book in terms of uh, the, the ones we've discussed here. But that's for a reason. You're just getting so much material. It could keep you busy for a very long time. And, and Johan's a, a fantastic teacher. Yeah, I would say, just to sum up, mastering chess strategy is by far the best. It's like way better than all the rest. I, I totally accept that people will quibble with my rankings and will move them around, but I don't care what you think about my rankings. What I really care about is if you want to be positionally better than your competition under 2200, then I highly encourage you read general strategy books. You play through annotated master games and you you go through a bunch of these puzzle books and try to understand deeply why the answers are what they are. If you do those three things, you're going to be better because I just don't see a lot of players under 2200. I'd love to get your view on that, Ben, but I just don't see a lot of players under 2200 pushing into these kind of positional puzzle books. Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree with that. My, my one uh, question would be what I always question, which is just like, you know, when you're gathering the data of playing your games, you just want to, you know, pay special attention to what's determining the outcome. Um, so to the extent that that your games are being decided by, you know, squishy factors, positional factors or whatever it might be, then I I definitely recommend it. But if you're just busted in the opening every time and losing because of the opening, then, you know, you might want to address that first. Or if you just keep falling for tactics or if you're like me and you're a bad time manager, um, you know, whatever it may be, you want to be attuned to your own game. But certainly if if you feel that positional chess is what you need to be addressing, then these are fantastic choices. And I agree with Neil that this is this is the best one. Although I, I would, I think we hinted at this earlier, but I would warn that this is one of the more challenging ones. So if you're rated, and Neil, you had mentioned something before we were recording, um, 
about like how to approach it if you like what if someone's rated 1500 but they're like man neil neil makes this book sound amazing like what what would you recommend should they do it or not neil so i would say it's hard to make the case for a 1500 maybe more like 16 1700 uh there are probably other things that you could be working on whether it be you know tactics or end games or other things or frankly just reading some more general strategy or pawn books but what i would say is if you don't tackle some of these other books first, which are easier and will warm you up to this, like I did. If you don't bother to do that and you go right to number one, then I can't stress it enough. Look at the answers when you after you try to solve the problems. And if they make no sense, you should talk to your coach or a stronger player. The only value of these books is if you can decipher the answers and you can create the patterns necessary to do them over and over again in the sense that you see the same idea, but with a slightly different variation and your subconscious immediately says, oh, this is a candidate move. It may not be the best move, but it's like one of the ones I need to evaluate. That's what you're looking for with these positional puzzle books is the the answer given should be one of the top three or four uh, ideas in the position that you're starting to notice. And that's when you know that you're getting positionally stronger. That's That's kind of my rule of thumb. I need to see the idea and at least consider it as one of the strongest opportunities. But I, I can't stress it enough that you will you will eventually, as you get stronger, need to play better positionally. And Helston actually makes, I'll read this really quick. He had this uh, little, his prose are literally like a paragraph before each chapter. But he wrote this great uh, se- you know, sentence or two around the link between tactics and strategy. So I'll just read it really quickly. He said, I often heard and more experienced players make this distinction between chess players who are either tacticians or positional players. Many years later, my experience tells me that every game contains a high amount of both tactical and strategic challenges, and these are often closely related and intertwined. Therefore, both strategy and tactics have to be mastered in order to aspire to any success, no matter what the personal style is. So that to me sums up kind of my view on this is Yes, I think chess is probably 70% tactics, 30% strategy. But as you get higher up, the strategy matters more. And so for those players who are trying to push forward into 17, 18, 19, you know, expert level and beyond, uh, strategy is what's going to separate you uh, because the tactical blunders are going to come fre- less frequently. Yeah, yeah, well said. And and Neil, just since this is one of the more challenging books, um techniques of positional play, would you say that that's like at a slightly lower level? Is that one that people might consider doing first? Yeah, I would recommend uh, like doing the techniques of positional play and Ray Chang's practical chess exercises first. They are both excellent warm-ups. And I, I read uh, Chang's book prior to reading Mastering Chess Strategy. I'd already created a thousand or so positional flashcards prior to reading Mastering Chess Strategy. So I think kind of like when we did the pawn books and we talked about Shanklin's books were understandable to me because I'd read six other books prior to them. Uh, right. I think this book also is more understandable if it's not your first puzzle book, but I highly recommend it. And if you're over 2000, I would say, you know, go for this book right away. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's plenty of challenging material and, and yeah, lots of use of uh, classics from world champions and the like. So, and Johan's own games as well. Um, Cool. Well, Neil, a pleasure as always. Now, uh, before we let you go, we got to catch up a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, COVID is finally receding a little bit. Um, any, I know you're busy with work stuff. You, you got a lot going on there. Um, plus, you've been putting in hours a day on this. But any any uh, plans of maybe making it to a tournament soon? Yeah, yeah this year I've got to get to some tournaments. I just need to. Uh, it's really good to see that COVID is really starting to wind down. And so my club, local club, has lots of older people in it. Like when I say older, I mean like in their 70s and 80s plus. Uh, and so they've been fairly cautious. But if they don't open soon, I'm going to hit the road and start hitting some over-the-board tournaments. My my chess you know, board and clock are, are, are like feeling like I've found a new mistress. So I've got to go out there and <laughs> play some games and uh, – Win, win and lose, but like I was playing in the open section 
at my club prior to uh, COVID because I had one I tied for first, I think, in the under 2000 section. So my rule was always to play up after I've won in a, in a section. So I want to play tougher opponents and I plan to lose, but I plan to learn. Yeah. I mean, I can't wait to see because, you know, there's something special about playing over the board and obviously it gives you a heightened environment and more time to try to sort of assimilate all of these ideas. I mean, you've put in so much study, so I would definitely encourage you to, to, uh, to, to go take the test. But, uh, but Neil, it's been awesome as always. Um, you can hit us up on Twitter if, if you have questions, um, anything else we should add, Neil? Well, I, I have a question. Um, I mean, I feel so cruel asking this cause it's like, you've just sort of run through this gauntlet of chess training activity, but, but what's next in the 10 year plan? Yeah. So my final year of my three year strategy work is game collections. So I'm going to go through 12 game collection books. So I, I've already done the first book of Morphe that we've talked about, uh, but I'm going to go through Chernev's books. I'm going to go through uh, the the Ready book, which is uh, Mastering Masters of the Chessboard, and then I'm going to go through uh, Alekhine, Capablanca, and then some modern ones, Shiroff's Fire on the Board, a couple books, uh, uh, or Polgro's three books. Oh, good. I was going to suggest those. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've got one more. uh, Just give me one second or I'm going to get the the name wrong. Uh, I've got two books that are uh, about Karpov, uh, Karpov Strategic Wins 1 and 2 by Tibor. uh, I'm going to get his last name. Karoli, maybe? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, so um, so I, I'm looking forward to. I've loved the few Karpov books uh, games I read uh, from the earlier general strategy books. I loved, and he he. I feel like he doesn't get as much appreciation uh, as he lately as he should on his strategic play. It's it's so masterful. So I'm looking forward to that. And frankly, it'll be a nice balance to do some share off too. Yeah. Game collections are fun. Like when I think about what you've just done in terms of like all the flashcards and stuff, obviously like studying chess can be fun. And uh, I think what you've done will reap great benefits, but playing through the classics, like that's just, that's just a pleasure. Um, so, so yeah, looking forward to, uh, to, and uh, one thing tricky about that is whereas with this, you know, we're saying there's a couple of omissions, you know, people are going to say, why didn't you do this book? Why didn't you do that book? But with the game collection, you better brace yourself because there's oh, so many, so many fantastic game collections. Um, as we record this, Chris Chabri and I are going to uh, recap Mammoth, um, the Mammoth book of chess games, which is a fantastic sort of one-stop shopping for classic chess games. That, that podcast will probably be out before this one. But anyway, I mean, there's just so many possibilities. So it's almost not fair to start with the, why don't you do this one? I know. Well, I, I had to cut it down because I think I had like 20 game collections. I wanted to do Fisher's book. Um, 60 my, memorable 60, games. But I, honestly, I decided that book's probably um, going to be better for me when I'm higher rated. Yeah, and I think you're, yeah. I don't know. Like, I, it, it's very hard to, I've only got 12 more months on this round. Uh, and I had to pick my, I had, to, I had to like leave some off the list. But I feel like these 12 I've chosen are classics or, or by some of the best players in the world and will will serve me by doing these. I've, I've already played through from just all my other, you know, I'm doing 36 strategy books in about 36 months. The books I've already read, I've been keeping track. I've played through 1,400 annotated master games already. And these 12 books will give me at least another 1,000. So that'll get me to 2,400 annotated games that I've played through every single move on a chess board. And I feel like that's the foundation I need, along with the general knowledge. And and every day for the next year, I'm going to be going through some of these 1700 positional puzzles as well as some tactical puzzles. I feel like that's what I'm c- calling as mastering the basics of strategy. And then next year I'm, o- I'm on to end games. Amazing. All right. Well, it'll be fun for the continued reports, Neil. It's always a pleasure. Thanks as always. Thank you, sir. Thanks to everyone who helps make perpetual chess possible. 
Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, But most of all, thanks to everyone for listening, and we will catch you all on the next episode.